We hope that you enjoy this message. For additional talks, please visit abcchurch.com. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to study your word, to be in your house, to worship in freedom. Don't let, let us ever take that for granted. And Lord, we're excited about what you're doing. Your spirit is moving. So as we open your word, we ask that it would just come alive in our hearts. And that's our prayer in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. A couple had been married for 60 years. They were sitting on the front porch, just swinging on their front porch swing and feeling romantic. The wife said, I remember when you used to always hold my hand. Oh, the husband reached over and grabbed her hand. She said, I remember when you used to kiss me on the cheek. He leaned over and gave her a little kiss on the cheek. She said, I remember when you used to nibble on my ear. He got up and started walking away. She said, what's wrong? Where are you going? He goes, I got to go get my teeth. How <laughs> I many say that brings back memories? <laughs> Or how many say, I don't even remember those days? Yeah. When Sandy and I started dating, uh, we figured out real quickly that we grew up in totally different family cultures. My mom, she's probably watching right now. Hi, mom. My mom is fairly proper and formal. Sandy's mom, Joanne, is not formal. She's more casual. For instance, at dinner time, when my mom sets the table, how many can relate to this? She has the silverware in the proper place according to the rules of etiquette. How many know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you put the salad fork outside the entree fork. Then you have the dessert fork where? On the top. On the, thank you so much. On the top. That is exactly where that goes. That was just for the forks. There's a whole other routine for the spoons and the knives and the water glass and, you know, all that. And uh, it, it is an incredibly proper thing that you must do. And it didn't matter who you were having over, you set the table. People used to say about my mom, she sets a very nice table. You know, when you walk up, you're like, wow, check this out. So I'll never forget the first time Sandy said, my mom wants to invite you over for dinner. I actually thought in my head, I'm anxious to see how Sandy's mom sets a table. Well, I get over there, and dinner's about to be served, and there's nothing on the table. There's actually nothing on the table. <laughs> and so we sit down, and Sandy's mom, I, by the way, I love Sandy's mom, and she, and I love my mom, <laughs> Sandy's mom, and she comes out, she sets a casserole dish in the middle of the table on a pot holder. Then she takes a pile of silverware and just throws it down next to the casserole with some napkins wrapped around it. Sandy's dad, Jack, says a really quick prayer, and he was a pastor, he normally prayed very long, but when it's a time to eat, it's a quick prayer. God bless this food, amen. Then all of a sudden, I see Sandy lean over her plate, and she goes, <sighs> I go, what are you doing? She goes, well, dad will steal our food right off of our plate. So we haw on it. We breathe on it. <laughs> that way he won't want it because <laughs> we've contaminated it with our germs. I was in shock. I thought I had walked into the twilight zone. <laughs> I was like, Wow! I was an outsider coming into a family with a different culture. You know, there's no manual to help you know how to behave in a culture. I remember when I first started working at Honeywell in Phoenix. I got transferred from Honeywell here to Honeywell down in Phoenix. And when I would come in on Monday morning, everyone would be talking about the decisions that had been made. I'm like, did I miss a meeting on Friday? Did they have a late night meeting on Friday night? When, was the, when were all these decisions made? It didn't take me long to figure out I wasn't going golfing on Saturday. The big decisions were made on the golf course on Saturday. You know what I did? I got me some clubs. <laughs> I'm like, if I'm going to be part of this culture, I'm going to have to learn how to golf or at least carry the clubs around, you know? 
So I was an outsider. When you are an outsider, it's hard to know how to conduct yourself. I have good news for you, though. God uses outsiders. My message to you today, yeah, you can cheer the Lord. A little participation won't hurt anything. It'll help keep you awake, by the way. <laughs> My message to you today is step outside your comfort zone. I have proof that Jesus is an outsider. It's found in Hebrews chapter 13 in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12 and 13. I'd like for us to read this out loud together. It's up on the screen. Would you read it with me nice and loud? And so Jesus also suffered outside. Let's read that again twice as loud. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. That is good news for all of us. That means outsiders like you and me, we can boldly go to the throne of grace to get what we need help with from God. We're going to look at two prophets today in the Old Testament. Their names are Elisha and Elijah. There's only two letters difference in their name, Elisha and Elijah. But they're very different people, very different prophets. Let's talk about Elijah first, since he came first. Elijah just went through a tough time of depression before the story we're going to look at today. He's a man of God. There is no question about that. He called fire down from heaven on a mountain called Mount Carmel. It burned the wood, but also the rocks and the water that he had poured all over the altar. He wanted to show that Jehovah God could start a fire when it was a sopping wet mess. So he defeated 450 prophets of Baal. You know you are a bad dude when you can tear up 450 dudes on your own. But right after that incredible victory, Elijah ran from this wicked queen, Jezebel. In fact, Jezebel had made a threat to him, and that's what scared him so bad. Jezebel said, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I don't kill you, Elijah, by this time tomorrow. How many of you would take off running if you heard somebody say that who is the number two person in the kingdom? I'm going to kill you by this time tomorrow. And it scared Elijah. After he had taken care of 450 false prophets, they were all killed by the Lord. Then this one lady, Jezebel, says, I'm going to kill you by this time tomorrow. And for some reason, he turned and ran. Life goes south. And Elijah ended up hiding in a cave. That can happen to all of us. Things change. Life goes south. All of a sudden, you just want to run. You want to hide in a cave. You want to die. But I know this story today is going to bless you. Elijah had actually lost his will to live. He told the Lord, just let me die. This is too hard. Just let me die. Maybe you said that to God sometime. So what did God do? Did he just tell him, dude, you need to toughen up. Come on now. Come on, Elijah. Get back to work. No, God did not do that. God ministered to him first. He gave him food. He gave him water. And then he let him sleep. And when he woke up, he gave him more food and more water and said, go back to sleep. I want you to know today God cares about how thirsty you are, how hungry you are, and how much lack of sleep. Think of that this afternoon. God knows you need another hour of sleep that you were robbed this morning. God cares about how you're doing today. But then, here's the cool thing. God had a new mission for him. ABC Church, God has a new mission for you. Oh, that was a weak amen. I'm going to have to try that again. Let me, maybe I didn't say it with enough feeling. ABC Church, God has a new mission for you. Yeah. <laughs> I imagine you've all heard the news, but in case you didn't hear it, we have exciting news to tell you about today. Last Sunday, the membership of ABC Church voted 96% yes to mer merge our church, combine our churches with New Life Midtown. 
New Life Midtown is one of eight campuses of the larger church of New Life up north. It's a huge step, but it's what we prayed for. We prayed for more people to come in. We prayed for us to have the ability to have more staff. We prayed for a big Easter. We prayed for God to use this building to fill it up. And he did it in a way maybe we didn't see coming. I want to show you the video that New Life Church showed this weekend. They did it Friday night, they showed it, and then Saturday night, and then they showed it again this morning. They're showing it right now. But I got a clip of the video they're showing, and I want you to see how excited our new family that's going to join us, see how excited they are about coming here. Check this out. This is what I want to tell you tonight. There's a fun announcement, okay? Are you ready for a good story? Yeah. February 1st Wednesday, we're over there worshiping, and we had a great night of prayer, and Lisa's walking out, and she sees an old friend from 18 years ago that she started teaching with on day one at the Classical Academy Central Campus. And she said, Annie, what in the world? Annie doesn't go to New Life and she was just there to worship. And so they started talking and catching up on life. And Annie said, yeah, and if you could be praying, our church is gonna vote this Sunday. Uh, we're, we're gonna vote to see if we should sell our building because we're about to go into foreclosure. And it was heartbreaking. And 40-year-old and church, they've been faithful in the city and and so Lisa said, well, you know, we'll be praying. And so we get home and Lisa tells me about that conversation with Annie. And I tell that to Pastor Brady and Pastor Brady calls the pastor the next morning and begins a conversation. He says, first, I'm so sorry. I know what it was like when New Life couldn't pay our mortgage and we wondered if we would make it. That was us 15 and a half years ago. So I ache with you. I'm so sorry that that's happening. Second thing. If you think there's a way that we can support or we can help or we can partner together or combine or just join our strength, you let us know. Well, this last Sunday, that church voted 53 to 2 to combine churches with New Life Midtown. I want to show you this. It's Austin Bluffs Community Church, six acres right off Austin Bluffs and near Stetson Hills. They've been there 40 years. It's got a 450-seat auditorium. It's an unbelievable property with a great core of about 80 people that go to that church. They're going to combine with New Life Midtown, which has been meeting a mile down the road from them forever. Y'all, look what the Lord has done. This is a bona fide miracle, and God has provided for us. So we celebrate what God is doing, and I just can't wait to tell you more and more stories of God's faithfulness, and be praying with us for New Life East, and for New Life Downtown, and for New Life Manitou to have these kind of miraculous stories of permanent space. One more time, can we celebrate God's faithfulness? Do you see how excited they are? It's like moving in with your relatives. We got the house, they got the big family. How many think only God could match that so good? It's like, boom. Yeah, and the video doesn't quite capture it. We got invited to their staff meeting. They're all staff meeting, which is like 200 people on Thursday. And our staff of four went over. And they had to sit in the front. I'm so happy for them and for you because when they showed that video, the staff erupted in a roar and applause and weeping. This one guy behind me, when they showed the gym, he was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I was like, you must like the gym. <laughs> it was so fun to see how they're excited about being a combined church of our two church families. It's an exciting combining of two groups of people for kingdom work for God. And on Sunday, March 26, Pastor Jay Duncan will be your new pastor. For all this to come together, it was really necessary that I would not be your pastor. It's not because the board forced me out. It's not because I had a moral failure or there was something wrong with the money. You can ask any board member to verify that. Nothing like that has happened. 
I also want to make sure you know I love you so much. Uh, you're not supposed to get this attached <laughs> in seven months. How in the world did that happen? Knock it off, you guys. That was not cool. You're supposed to take your time. Mm. So don't think I'm leaving and going, phew, those people were weird. Thank God he pulled me out of there. No. Love you so much. It makes sense, though. I want to make sure you understand. It's not a weird thing. It makes sense. Pastor Jay, for 12 years, has been the pastor of 450 people in that campus. I've been your pastor seven months for 82 people. So rather than 450 people getting weird, getting weird, getting used to the weird pastor, <laughs> Pastor Lee, uh, only 82 of you have to get used to Pastor Jay. So it's, it, it's the right thing. All these things were talked about last week before we voted. If you were here, it was a two-hour meeting. So next Sunday is going to be my farewell message to you. So uh, I hope you'll be here. We're going to party down. How many want to party down? Yeah. Now, some of you have already had time to process all this. Others, you are probably sitting here going, what? If you're visiting with us here today, God bless you. I'm so glad you're here. Make sure you come back for at least the next two or three weeks because you won't really see what the church is like until then. But stay with me today, will you? This is exciting. And it's going to take some stepping out of your comfort zone. And Elijah realized that he had to step outside of that cave to do what God wanted him to do. Elijah, it would have been so easy for Elijah to stay there in the cave. Elijah's destiny required him to move out of his comfort zone. So that's where we're going to pick up our story today in your outline. Jesus uses outsiders to, number one, break out of the same old routine. Oh, it's going to get personal now. 1 Kings 19, verse 19. Here comes Elijah, having just got out of the cave. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he with the 12th. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Elijah finds Elisha plowing. He, he's in the family business. He probably had no choice. His dad probably said, we farm the land you're going to farm the land. In those days, even who you married was determined by somebody else, by your family. So Elisha is now in the family business. Can you imagine how it works? Go to the farm, go to the church, go home. Go to the farm, go to church, go home. Say it with me. Go to the farm, go to church, go home. You say, well, I would never do anything like that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes one moment will change your whole life. So many times God places you at the right place with the right person to be confronted with the right moment. And you will have to take action to seize the moment. Turn to the person next to you right now and say, this is my moment. Go ahead and tell them. This is my moment. Say it with feeling. This is my moment. <laughs> you don't want to miss this. Don't miss your moment. Some of you, your life is like Elisha. I'm not saying that in a mean way, but gas station, <laughs> Starbucks, <laughs> work home. Gas station, say it with me now. Starbucks, work, home. Gas station, <laughs> Starbucks. Some of you, if you don't show up at Starbucks, 
and for three days, the people who work there ask you, where you been? They probably know how much money you spent at Starbucks. They're keeping track of it. They're like, she spent a zillion dollars, Carrie, at Starbucks. <laughs> we joke around, if Carrie doesn't have her venti latte, leave her alone. Don't talk to her. Let her find her some coffee somewhere. What is God going to do? How is he going to call you? Well, here's what you're going to have to do. Number two, kiss being in control. Goodbye. Oh, verse 20. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. Elijah, see, he knew what was being offered to Elisha. Remember, he threw his mantle over him. That was the way of saying, I want you to succeed me. I want you to take my place. I'm throwing my mantle on you. You're going to come after me and do what I've been doing. Very serious. But Elisha didn't know how much Elijah was a man of God. He was a farmer. He's just plowing the land. He's not going to the prophet school. He's just a farmer. So sometimes God doesn't give us the details. But that doesn't mean you can't feel it. You can't see it. You can't realize God's working. So Elisha was willing to step out of his routine. It says he kissed his mother and father goodbye. He kissed control goodbye. He kissed routine goodbye. How many of you have learned you're never in control in the first place anyway? <laughs> I have good news for some of you today. Today, you can resign as the manager of the universe. Today's the day. You can resign. Do any of you know a manager of the universe? Next to me. Elisha can, kisses the control goodbye so he can step outside into the new. Elijah was looking for the successor. Do you know right down the street, there was a school of prophets. Elijah walked right past the school of prophets to Elisha, the farm boy. Isn't that crazy? It just goes to show you there are some people that are preparing for something. They're taking classes to learn how to do it. They're taking training. They're working really hard to learn how. And sometimes God bypasses those people those experts to come talk to you, a renegade, and you have no experience, you are completely out of your league, and God goes, that's who I want to use, the one who's out of their league, the one who will have to depend on my power. How many think that's a pretty good place to be? God purposely does not call people from the inside group sometimes. He calls them from outside the system. We are doing something outside the system as a church. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. Uh, we are not part of our denomination anymore. We paired up with a non-denom church. There's been a, a, a hot wind blowing in Pastor Lee's direction for the last few days, but that's okay. This is what God loves to do is do something unbelievable, un seen, unplanned for. How many love God's spontaneity, how he does that? God goes, watch what I will do. I don't care about your rules. Anybody here ever been blessed because you were misfits? God says, I want you. Turn to the person next to you and say, I shouldn't have got it, but I did. Go ahead and tell them. I shouldn't have got it, but I did. I shouldn't have got the job, but I did. I shouldn't have got that business given to me, but I did. I shouldn't have got her to marry me, but I did. Thanks, babe. <laughs> but you had to kiss those old things goodbye. You need to kiss your bad attitude goodbye. Say it with me now. Do the kissing motion. Hold your two fingers. Here you go. Kiss your bad attitude goodbye. Very good. Kiss your old habit, bad habits goodbye. Kiss your mindless routine goodbye. Go to Dutch Bros tomorrow. <laughs> number three honor the past but move out on the new 
Look at the dramatic action Elisha took in verse 21. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people and they ate. This is amazing. Can you imagine? These are the oxen that plowed the fields all those years. They were good oxen. They wouldn't have been there unless they served him well. Now he goes and he slaughters those awesome plowing oxen and he feeds the people with the meat. He uses the burning plow wood to actually cook the meat. You know what he was saying? I'm not going to be able to go back. I'm going to cut this thing to where I can't go back. Thank God for some things in our past that we killed off so we couldn't go back. How many agree? Or else we couldn't have stepped into the new things. Sometimes we try to step into the new thing like this. We're holding on. Okay, God, I'm ready. I'm yours. I'm all in. Nope, I don't think so. No, you need to go. Plows burning, oxen are cooking, it's a big barbecue. All right, Lord, that is done. Here I am. That's how God likes to move when you say, I burned the plow, I cooked the meat, I can't possibly go back. God goes, all right, here we go. Great breakthroughs come from burning the plow. There's even a story about, who was it that came across the ocean to America and he didn't want his men to think they could go back to Spain or something like that. And what did he do? He set the ships on fire. You, you history buffs, tell me who that was. It doesn't matter. Who cares about history? So anyway, <laughs> and they said that was called burn the ships, you know. So it's, it's daylight savings. It'll come to you later this afternoon. You'll go, oh, I remember who it was. It was Ponce de Leon or it was, you know, Columbus or something like that. Don't worry about it. That was a bad question. Sorry, I put you on the spot. Unless you let go of the old ways, the new things can't come. When you cling to the old thing, you strangle the new thing. God loves to do a new thing in our lives. And God wants to, number four, challenge me to be a sweeter leader. Oh, yes. The last part of verse 21, it says, Then he set out to follow Elijah and become his attendant. Attendant. Huh. Elisha has received the mantle from Elijah. His starting position is what? Vice prophet? Assistant prophet? Prophet pro tem? No, he's the assistant. He's the guy who helps take care of him. He's the guy who brings him his food. He's the guy who's taking care of him. You know what that required? Humility, servant attitude. He had to be sweeter. If you're a serving someone and assisting them, one, them and, and helping them with their life, you have to have a sweet attitude. How, how many agree? You have to learn how to be sweet. So today, you're going to have an opportunity to be a sweeter ABC person. After the service, we're going to have some ABC merchandise that has been given out over the years. The leftovers of all the giveaways are in this massive closet. It's about the size of this auditorium. <laughs> and over 34 years, Pastor John and Sherry Pauls, we're here, and Sherry had a company where she got access to that for a huge discount, and so they bought all this swag. Say that word with me, swag. So there's still lots of vintage ABC Church coffee mugs, water bottles, pens, cool tote bags, lots of stuff, lots of pens, lots of pens. Please take many pens. And we're thankful that we had some pizza donated by someone in the church. Give them a little hand for donating pizza. We always love the pizza donators. And so we're going to have lunch, and you can pick out all the ABC merchandise you want. If you want to set your table with ABC merchandise, I'm pretty sure you can do it. I think we got the stuff. <laughs> and who knows, maybe ABC Church merchandise is about to become collectible, just like that. Just like that, it'll be on eBay. They'll go, what? You have ABC Church merchandise? That's not obtainable anymore. 
I really want to ask you earnestly to stick around for what happens next. After that, we're going to have lunch. We're going to get some ABC merchandise. You could take it out to your car, get big boxes, pull up your car, open the trunk, shovel it all in. But at noon, Pastor Jade and his staff and all the Midtown New Life people are coming over here. We're going to have an open house for them. We're just going to open our doors and they're going to flood. 400 people are going to flood in here. So I was thinking, have, have you ever been to somebody's house and you've never been there before and you walk in and they make you feel weird? Have you ever, has that ever happened to somebody? That happened to Sandy and I. We got invited over by this couple and it was here in Colorado Springs even and we, and we knock on the door and they open the door and it, it was so weird because they just turned around and started walking to the living room. They didn't say, hi, welcome to our house, hug us, handshake us, high five us, nothing. They just opened the door and then like, <laughs> I'm like, I guess we follow them into the house. And they're standing there walking in and it's like, I mean, it was so awkward. It sent a message. It was like, who are you and why are you here? It's like, you invited us over here. What do you mean? What are you doing? So I know you are definitely not like that. I'm not even worried. This is the friendliest church I've ever been to. Right here. Give yourselves a big hand. You are a friendly group of people. But let's take it even up a notch today. Would you do that? So here's what I was thinking. You can tell me if this is a bad idea or not. But I thought hundreds of people about to come in our front door around noon. So what I thought we could do is like form a line, two lines, and like give them a hallway to walk through out there just between us. Like they come in, you know, like they do in football games. There are like the players who come running out and the cheerleaders are on the side. And you know, so I thought we could be cheerleaders. We'll welcome them. We want to make sure they know we were expecting you. We're so excited you're here. Welcome to your new home. Our home is your home. You can yell out, mi casa, su casa. You can yell out, welcome home. You can check out your new digs, whatever you want. How many agree we could do that? Would you do that with me? I'm going to be right there. We form two lines at the front door. Just let them come in and just walk around with them. We go, come see the chapel. Come look at the snack bar in the youth area. Come here, I'll show you that closet where we kept all the merch. <laughs> like, you know, show them the place, you know? Won't that be fun? Yes. Let's welcome our new family. And number five, stay committed to my church. Stay committed to my church. We're going to turn over just a few chapters to 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 2. Here's what it says there. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now you go, what's going on with this? Bethel, what does that mean? The word Bethel literally translates in the original language, the house of God. So Elijah wanted to go up to the house of God. And Elisha said, I will not leave you. I want you to be Elisha's. I will not leave you. When something happens at a church and we don't like it, you know what we tend to do in America now? It's just kind of ended up this way. See, when we were in all in small towns and there weren't these big cities, if, if something happened to your church you didn't like, it's like, well, this is the only one here. Or there's only three and I tried the other two. You know, it's like you had to stay with your church, even if something you didn't like happened. But I want you to know when something happens that you don't really care for, it's not about that thing. It's a test. Will you stay committed? See, there's power in staying. There's joy in staying. Have you noticed we live in a crazy world? Just a little, right? Good grief. California is having atmospheric rivers run through it now, which means they're like there's just dumping snow, dumping rain. They're having another one right now. It's incredible. You know, they were praying for the drought to end. I think now they're going to have to pray for the mudslides to stop. 
It's just an incredible, weird, atmospheric thing happening over California, and even it drifts over here sometimes. And then UFOs. How many have noticed all this UFO stuff all of a sudden? How many think UFOs are real? Bunch of chickens. You know you think some of them are real. And Russia and China and North Korea are all threatening the United States right now. Bill Gates is buying up all the farmland. I'm sure that's innocent. And yesterday, two days ago, we had a run on a bank in California. Seventh biggest bank in the United States. In one day, closed. It's a dangerous world we live in. So God never promised us a problem-free existence. What he promised is he would help those who believe in him. You say, oh, so we'll be rich while everybody else is poor? No. But God will walk with us so we will not be afraid when the three men in the Old Testament are thrown into the fiery furnace, they should have been immediately incinerated. But it says, Nebuchadnezzar went and looked, and he saw a fourth person in there. And he said, that fourth person looks like a son of God. <laughs> it was the son of God. It was Jesus. He was in the fire with them. And they came out and they didn't even smell like smoke. That's the Lord you have and I have. Amen. What he promises is that he would help those who believe in him. When you have your faith in Jesus, you suddenly have some serious power on your side. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I accept I ask you to forgive me and save me. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that in just a moment. And I promise I won't embarrass you. When you walk through a storm, you need someone who walks with you. And that's what a church family is for. Sandy and I bought the Krispy Kreme donuts for you today. You know why? Just to tell you we love you. To pour some sugar on you. But also there's another reason. The Latin Crispus Cremus. I don't know if you know this, it actually means my sweet church friend. That's what it means. Crispus Cremus, my sweet church friend. <clears throat> J JK. <laughs> Never in a million years did I think I would be here for just seven months. But my favorite thing about all of you is how much you adopted me and Sandy into your family. Just like that. We were your family, too. So I want you to do the same for New Life Midtown. Do that thing you do, ABC. Just welcome them, adopt them, come alongside them. And I think they're going to do the same thing with you. But can I level with you for a second? You might be thinking, well... After that new pastor gets here and all those people get here, I'll wait a respectable amount of time, a week, and then we'll decide if we're staying or not. Or you might be thinking, I've already decided. I'm not staying. Or you might be thinking, no, I don't like new life. Could I please suggest you don't do that? having 400 people suddenly in our church? That's what we were praying for. That's what we were praying for. That's what we fasted and prayed for in January. Why in the world, now that God answered our prayer and bailed us out of our financial problems, why would we turn around right after they get here and go, we're out? That's definitely not cool. I'm being a little tough on you, but man, stay here. Stay here. Pastor Jade might preach a total brick on his first Sunday. Don't judge him by that. I mean, I'm not saying he maybe he never preaches a brick. I don't know. That was a bad thing to say. That wasn't in the notes, honey. Ugh. But you know what I'm saying? Don't judge it by one Sunday. He might, the Sunday number two, he might feel really good and he'll be well rested and he'll just kill that thing and you'll have missed it because you go, wow, I checked it out the first Sunday. It wasn't very good. No, be a leader. Be a leader. 
Real leaders don't leave right now. Will you stay? Please stay. You say, Pastor Lee, they pay you to do this or what? No. I'm a pastor. I want what's best for you. I don't want the sheep to scatter all around Colorado Springs, trying on other churches, walking in, and you can feel real alone when you walk into a new church the first time, and then you go, that wasn't fun, and you try three more, and then all of a sudden, one Sunday, you don't even get up. I've seen it so many times. It only takes about four Sundays for you to stop going to church. So come here. You'll see your friends. You might have trouble finding them. It'll be fun. It'll be like Easter egg hunt. <laughs> Where in the world is Mark Bailey? I do not see him anywhere. I'm going to make another lap through the whole facility and see if I can find that guy. Where's James? I've never had trouble finding James. The guy sticks out like a sore thumb. You know, he's bald and he's huge and he's muscular and I cannot find Irene. I have looked everywhere. Where is that lady? Won't that be fun? How many agree that would be fun? Finding your ABC friends. Right now, you're like, well, I know she sits there every Sunday. I know he sits there every Sunday. Starbucks, gas station, go home. How many think we should change it up a little bit for once, huh? Here's something that could happen. You might walk in and the place you've sat for the last 11 years, there'll be a new lifer sitting there. <laughs> Can I coach you? Please do not walk up and go, how dare you? That's where I sit. I'll wait five seconds while you get out of my chair. You could walk all the way around and find a new spot to sit. Please, please stay here. Stay here. This, is, this place is anointed. How, how many of you were around when we wrote on the floors and the walls of this place? Raise your hand if you helped write scriptures and write stuff on the walls. This place has been sealed by the Holy Spirit. Do you know when New Life staffers came here the first time and walked in the doors? They said, we can feel the anointing on this place. That's you. That's you. You need to keep that here. Help keep it here. Keep the anointing. Keep God's presence. Keep that sweet, friendly spirit that you have. Here's what goes with that last one, number six. Have high expectations for the future. So this is what happened right before Elijah was taken up to heaven. Elijah is part of a very elite group, a group of two people who never died. Do you know who the other one is? Elijah and Enoch. Those are the only two people who did not earthly die, did not physically die on earth. Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind to heaven. But right before that, here's what happened, 2 Kings 2.9. <clears throat> when they had crossed... Elijah said to Elisha, tell me, what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? Here's his answer. Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. What a beautiful request. You know what, Elijah? I know you're amazing. You're incredible. I know you've done some fantastic things. I've heard all about it. I've learned about it. If I could just have double that, Ah, what an incredible time I'm going to have. I am praying that for y'all. I think God is going to do something incredible here because it's not normal. It's not by all the typical things that would happen. It's something crazy. AB Search, ABC Church, little did you know, our dead end as a church, financially, and all the things that were coming at us, I believe it's going to be our crowning achievement, New Life Midtown. I hope at Easter, there's a police helicopter flying overhead going, what do we do with all the traffic at that church? Who started that? 
Go ahead and blame me. I won't be here. <laughs> Go ahead and it's Lee. He didn't think about the traffic at Easter. Wouldn't that be awesome? They radio in. I don't know what's going on, but there's a traffic jam at that church there on Austin Bluffs. It's, a, it's bigger than Rocky Mountain. It's bigger than all the... How many think that would be awesome? And they have an altar call, and all these people come down here to the front and get saved. And then they all need to be baptized. His name was Todd. Todd was going to college. He was taking business classes. He wrote a business plan. The instructor gave him an F. He goes, what? No. Stupidest idea. Didn't you do your research? That doesn't work. That is not a good plan. I'm sorry I had to flunk this paper. Todd took his business plan. He said, I don't, I'm not giving up that easy. He bought a cheap suit, because he's a college kid. Put it on and went to a bank. Showed him his business plan that he got an F in. You know what the banker said? I see why they give you an F. <laughs> That's a terrible business plan. He went to another bank, another bank, another bank. All of them said, nope. That's a terrible business plan. That will not work. Everybody knows that doesn't work. So, he looked up jobs that paid the highest amount of money. So one of the jobs that paid really good money was working in the oil fields of California. So he got trained and he worked there and he made a ton of money and he saved it all. He lived like a homeless man, saving all the money so that he could start his business. He wouldn't need a bank. After a while that job ended, he went to Alaska. He worked on a salmon fishing boat. Because that paid a lot of money. Super dangerous. You have to tie yourself to the deck rail or else you'll get thrown overboard with all the big waves and stuff. But he made a ton of money. He put all that away. Finally, he had enough money of his own to start what his business plan had said. And he started it. He actually bought a run-down, decrepit old building. And he, by himself, fixed all the furnishings, fixed the walls, fixed the roof, fixed the entrance to the place. It was a restaurant. You know what was wrong on the business plan? He said, I want the restaurant to serve just one item, but make it the best people have ever tasted. I think I'll name it after my dog, Cain. And so was born Raising Cain's. He did add French fries later. How many have been to Raising Cane's? How many agree? All they have is chicken fingers. I think they have toast now too. Toast, French fries, and chicken fingers. He's really expanded. <laughs> and they are good, aren't they? Not for your body, but they are good tasting. How many agree? You never know what looks so ridiculous so out of the box, so crazy, and you run into one obstacle after another, and God goes, watch what I will do with your obedience, with your dream, with the thing that I have led you to do. So ABC, I love what you've done, and I can hardly wait to see how it goes. How many are anxious to watch how it goes? Amen. Amen. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Lord, it's exciting to see you use outsiders. And Father, I may not be the best person for the job. I might not be the best person that you have ever seen that's been trained. But Lord, in my life and every life of every person sitting here and everyone watching online, you have a plan for us that doesn't require us to be an insider, doesn't require us to be perfectly trained. You will qualify the called. Help me seize the moment. Jesus. Help me be a sweeter leader. Help me be an encourager, a cheerleader. And I'll watch for my moment that you have for me. If you've never taken that step I talked about of committing your life to Jesus, I want to ask you to do that right now. If you haven't done it, please, right now, take that step. It's a dangerous world. Crazy things are happening everywhere. All you have to do is say, I accept 
Jesus, I accept you. Jesus, I accept your forgiveness. I accept that you're the son of God. I accept you died on the cross for my sins and I accept that you rose three days later from the grave and you're the son of God. I don't have to do anything. I just have to accept what you did for me. So I'm in. I'm in. I'm going to spend the rest of my life learning more about you. And would you make a reservation in heaven for me so that no matter what happens here on this earth, no matter how bad things might get, when I take my last breath, boom, I'll be standing at the gates of heaven and you will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter the happiness that has been planned for you from the beginning of time. And Lord, we thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed this message. For additional talks, please visit abcchurch.com.